Hey, we've been talking about radical discipleship, and go to the book of, uh, open your Bible to the book of John. There's just a couple of things, um, five things I want to share with you this morning about this particular text, um, just to kind of continue as we're in this season of Advent, and then next week we'll culminate that by looking at the third chapter of John, if, if the Lord continues to say the, sh the same as it relates to who Jesus is and what John would have us to receive in this book. So as we kind of walk through the lesson this morning, um, I want you all to do me a favor. Turn to your neighbor and say to your neighbor, neighbor, meet Jesus. He's God's remedy for sin. Yeah, yeah. Come on, find your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Say, meet Jesus. He's God's remedy for sin. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I, I, like, I like that thought. I like that big idea, you know. Um, you know, sometimes in your studies, um, as I was studying this weekend, and um, for those of you that are part of preaching team or part of our ministerial team, you know, the whole subject compliment thing to kind of find out what your big idea is. And when this thing dropped in my spirit, I was like, wow, interesting. I'd love to meet Jesus, and it's good to know Jesus, God's remedy for sin. And then I found out that John was an in, in an interesting predicament because what John was doing to the Jews and the people of that day and age is that he was introducing them to Jesus. Yeah, he was telling them, meet Jesus, God's remedy for sin. And the challenge that John had in introducing these people to Jesus is that they were in a place where they were so used to doing things their own way that it was difficult for them to see Jesus for who he is. And let me just go here real quick by way of application and connecting this. That's the problem we have with society today is that society is so used to doing things their own way. Come on. They're in their own framework. They're, they're in their own mindset that it's difficult for them to see Jesus for who he is. And so to kind of help you paint a picture, I need to go back to uh, at least an illustration of what we gave on Wednesday night to kind of lay foundation so you can understand what's really happening. And I need you to, to view this mic stand um, with my little remote control thing on it um, as the middle of time. And view this mic stand as the separation. I'm going to use the term between the old covenant and the new covenant. And on this side of the mic stand, it's everything about the old covenant and this side on, of the other side of the stand is everything about the new covenant. And I want you to, work, to notice that I'm using the word new covenant versus new testament. Because if I use the word to te new testament, I did this a little bit Wednesday. I realized after I reflected and processed on what was shared that that could be a little bit confusing. Because a lot of you will read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you will equate that to new covenant when I'm the guy that's going to say to you, it was not until Jesus made it to Calvary did new covenant begin. Did that, come on, you guys are tracking with me? So, so you understand the struggle. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are writing to people who have an old covenant framework. Come on, does that make sense? And they're functioning out of the old covenant framework. And it is out of this old covenant framework that John begins this process of introducing Jesus as God's remedy for sin. So visualize with me, church is happening, Jews are in control, the Sanhedrin, all that stuff is doing what they need to do. John comes on the scene and John kind of steps out on the limb a little bit and he begins the process of drawing this line that's the delineation between the two covenants that, that we're going to talk about a little bit today. John's problem is is that he steps out away from the city of Jerusalem, which was the center of re the religious activities, the center of worship, center of all that stuff, and he positions himself almost at the beginning of this line, and now he's baptizing people, and like we said Sunday, he's not only baptizing Gentiles that are being proselytized into Judaism, he's baptizing Jews and Gentiles alike. Matter of fact, he's baptizing everyone. And then he defines himself as a voice in the wilderness saying, prepare the way for one who is to come. And we talked about that extensively on last week and on Wednesday. We really went a lot deeper in it. But where I want to pick up today is now 
The whole time that John is talking about preparing the way, remember with me that Jesus, um, 30 years ago, before John, while John was doing this, lived 30 years of his life over here. Come on, y'all say amen. He lived 30 years of his life going to the temple in Jerusalem, worshiping in Jerusalem, hanging out with the scribes and the Pharisees in Jerusalem. He spent 30 years of his life on this side of the fence dealing with all those people, and then all of a sudden John breaks away, and don't forget that John and Jesus had a very close relationship in that they were family members. Come on, y'all know this. Jesus' first cousin. And so John steps out, and John now decides to bring a word to talk about um, what God would have him to do, prepare the way because Jesus is coming. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, when the time is right, breaks away from the crowd and starts to make his approach towards John. And as he makes his approach towards John, John looks up and John says, he sees him, and here's what John says, meet Jesus. Yeah, God's remedy for sin. And I want us to take a moment just to look at a few things in the text to kind of help paint a picture. So go with me to the book of John that um, Princess just read, and let's walk through this, and, and, and I hope I can make it in a good enough time. And, and look at verse 29, and let's talk through verse 29, and I'll share these things with you. It opens up by saying in verse 29, the next day, meaning subsequent to verses 19 and verse 28, the next day he being John saw Jesus coming towards him. And here's what John said, behold, or look, depending on your translation, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, there's a few things I need for you to understand about Jesus, um, number one, if we're going to meet Jesus. Number one, it's very, very important for you to understand with me that Jesus, number one, is God's Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I know this may sound elementary, and I know those of you who have been in church a long time, you know, we know what that means. We get that, but, but bear with me a little while if I understand this, because Let's go over here for a little while. And if you're over here in the Old Testament, understand with me that the cultic practices of the Old Testament were still going on. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If, if you sinned, if you committed some sort of a misdeed, what you had to do for your sins to be atoned for is you had to take a lamb. Come on, y'all. An unblemished lamb, this was Old Testament, and you had to take it to a priest, and the priest then would atone for your sins by killing that lamb and going through the cultic or the ritualistic practices of the Old Testament. Now, where I need you all to go with me for a little while, Mary and Joseph was not exempt from the practice. Y'all track it with me. Uh, so, so let me tell you what that means. That means when it came time for them to go to the temple for worship, guess what they had to do? They had to come with a little lamb, all right, even though they had the lamb in their hand. Y'all not getting this yet. And they had to come with a little lamb, and they had to go through the process because no Jew was exempt from the rituals of the Old Testament. Matter of fact, let me go here with you. You remember with me, it was why Zechariah was serving his duty of offering sacrifice for recompense for the sins of the people that when he was in the temple himself, and let me speculate, probably killing his own lamb for those who came, that's when the angel appeared to him and told him John the Baptist was going to be born. Y'all know this quite well. Come on, y'all know this. So, so every Old Testament now, the culture, the norm, everything about it was to follow the Deuteronomical laws about offering sacrifice for forgiveness of sins. So the, in the framework, all lambs did is they were raised, they fed the people, but more importantly, they were always offered on the altar of sacrifice of forgiveness of sins. Jesus steps out of the crowd. John sees Jesus, and here is how he identifies him, the Lamb of God, meaning that here now is the person that God has sent to perform the permanent, ultimate 
Let me, listen to the words that I'm using. Once for all sacrifice for the sins of the world. Okay? Meaning, I want y'all to meet Jesus. Because when you meet him, you won't have to go to the farm to buy a lamb anymore. I wish I had somebody in here. When you meet him, he's the end of the sacrificial system because he now is going to be God's lamb. He, he is God's lamb. He's going to perform the ultimate sacrifice. And I'm going to share something with him about Jesus if we can get to it toward the end of the message. But now he is the one that God sent into the world to be the ultimate sacrifice. But don't fool yourself. There's not a priest in the earth that's going to kill him on any altar. I wish I had somebody in here. So here's what he says about this Jesus now. A couple of things. He takes away, and don't miss the singular world, word, sin of the word, the world. When, when I read that, I really had to go back to the original language and say to make sure that that word was not plural. And then my translation of the Bible simply translated it in a singular form. It's the world, it's, the word, it's a singular word. Amartya is the Greek word, and it says sin singular because here's what he's saying about Jesus. When Jesus pays the price for sin, he has literally dealt with the sin issue of the world. Okay? This is very, very critical because in the Old Testament, it took multiple lambs every time a person sinned. And so annually or monthly or however frequent the time was, lambs keep on dying because sin kept on being an issue. And so now here's the thing. We've got one lamb that at the end of him offering himself up, Sin, I wish I had somebody in here, is no longer an issue. I know I struggle, and I know you struggle, and I know we go through what we go through with sin, but you got to hear me say sin is not an issue for the child of God if we understand the finished work of the Lamb on Calvary. So he deals with world sin. He deals with the struggles you have. He deals with the struggle I have. He deals with everything that we go through. He addresses the issue of sin. And what's shocking about this issue of sin, it's not just the sin of Jewish people. This is where John really begins to mess with them. Jesus is going to deal with the sin of the world. Remember him. I'm baptizing Gentiles and I'm baptizing Jews. And I'm saying to them, hang here, y'all, Jesus is coming. And Jesus now comes out from amongst the Jews. And here's what he says to them. I didn't just come for y'all. I didn't just came for you. I came for the entire world. This is why the book of John says it this way. He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many, it says, as received him, to them gave he power to become sons and daughters of God, even those who believe on his name. So the beauty of that is it doesn't matter your culture. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your racial descent. It doesn't matter your background. Jesus died for you. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Do me a favor, y'all. Wake up. Turn your neighbor and say, neighbor, Jesus died for you. Yeah, come on. Tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Jesus died for you. Yeah, this is a very, very interactive church. Come on, point yourself. Say, self, Jesus died for me. So listen to me. Since Jesus dealt with sin, don't have the enemy fooling you into thinking you can't get over whatever it is you're struggling with. He took care of it on the cross of Calvary. Are you hearing me this morning? He paid the price for sin. Not sins, meaning that there's one thing I got that Jesus can't handle. No, 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 baby. Or there's two things that I had since I was a child that Jesus can't deal with. No sin too big. Let me say it this way. No mountain too high. No valley too low. No ocean too wide. There is no problem that you and I can engage in that Jesus cannot take care of. He dealt with the issue of sin, and that's good news. Oh my gosh, this is good news. This is good news. This is good news. The more I process this thing, the more it gets in my spirit and the more excited I get about it because check, check this out. Check it out. Even though I'm sinful, the more holier I feel. Yeah. <laughs> because he took care of it. And you ought to feel the same way. 
because he took care of it. So number one, number one, he died, he died for the sin. He died for sins of the world. Look at the second thing, okay? Here, here's what Jesus says. Not only did Jesus die for the sins of the world as God's lambs, but as God's lamb, John says now he is both preexistent and now he is preeminent. Man, I like, I like this. Lock into this. Lock into this. And it says verse 21. Uh, no, not 21. What is that? Verse 30. This is he, John said, of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. This is heavy stuff. This is heavy stuff. Remember with me, John was born six months before Jesus. So here's what John would say in the flesh. I'm your older cousin. You better listen to me, boy, because I had rank. Come on, that's how John would say it. But here's how John positions himself when he finds himself in front of Jesus. He was before me, and he ranks before me. In other words, he's got more pull than I ever will have. Okay, I like that because I love the word preexistence. Here's what preexistent means because John now is starting to deal with the Christology associated with who Jesus is. He's starting to deal with the deity of Christ. What I'm really trying to say without saying it, I'm about to introduce you to God himself. That's why, that's why if you look at John's book, he opens up the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word was what? With God. And the Word what? Was God. And in case you missed that, he says the same was in the beginning by God. And in case you didn't read Genesis 1, he says all things were what? Made by him. And without him was any, y'all know that made, that was made. And in case you missed that, he says that in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Come on. And he says, and the light shined in darkness, and the darkness could not understand it. So here's what John is saying. The whole time Jesus was on earth, God was existent in the earth in that air right amongst you and you couldn't see it. He's preexistent. And what I love about the preeminence, the preeminence of God, hey, Pope, and Old Testament Pope, amen? Hey, hey, priest, hey, Sanhedrin, he above all y'all. Go, go to Colossians, y'all, real quick. Go to Colossians. Go to Colossians chapter 1. Go to Colossians chapter 1 and jump down to verse 15. And here's how Paul speaks to the preeminence of Christ in the church, to the church at Colossae. Colossians chapter 1. And Wednesday we're going to really get heavy on this stuff. Y'all want to come out on Wednesday. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Say amen when you're there. Here's what he says. 15 says, He being Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, it says, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things that hold together. Verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in, that in everything he might be what? My translation uses the word pre eminent. I like that because here's what John is saying. Hey, hey Sanhedrin, hey Jews, hey scribes, here's hey Pharisees, hey Gentiles, hey world, meet Jesus. And let me get ahead of myself and says, I want y'all to meet Jesus. He is God incarnate. And we're going to talk about he existed before all of you and he's above all of us. Here's what John said in 1 and 26. He says, this Jesus, he says, I am not even worthy to unloose the sandals on his feet. Really quick, and I didn't do a good job with this last week, but we talked about it this past Wednesday. Here's what you need to know about that framework. Every disciple, Ju um, Rabbi Julian said this, every disciple could do anything that their master asked them to do. Okay? So, so John, being a disciple of Jesus, and some commentators believe that Jesus was John's disciple the whole time, be, uh, because, since, because John's been doing ministry and he came before Jesus. But here's what the rule was. A disciple could do anything for their master except touch the shoes on their feet. 
The reason being, that role is not reserved for a disciple, is reserved for a servant or a slave. So those of you that know biblical history, the way this would work is when you showed up at the house of a person's home, because the road were dusty, they would have pails of water by the door, and they would have a hired servant sitting there to wash your feet. Come on. And here's what John's saying. Y'all might think I'm the biggest preacher right now, but I'm not even worthy to be a hired servant to stand at the door. Come on, y'all. Forget discipleship right now. I am not even worthy to take the job to wash Jesus' feet. Talk about being preeminent and preexistent. He understood who he was in the presence of Jesus. That's a different level of humility that you and I need to understand when it comes to putting ourselves in position of Jesus. So here's what it looks like to me. When I come in the presence of Jesus because of the dirt bag that I am, how dare me stand in his presence? I ought to be the one on my face. Come on. With my head to the ground because I am undeserving of being in his presence. My worship ought to look different. He is pre-existent and he is preeminent. That's what John says. And then look at this. Let's, let's walk through this. Look at, look at the next thing that, and then we're going to talk about the text. So based on that, I'm learning that it's possible to have met Jesus and not recognize him for who he is. Y'all get this? It, it's, yeah, let me explain it. Thank you, Deke. Yeah. <laughs> it's possible to meet him and not recognize him for who he is. Go back, go back, go back to John. Let's, let's, let me flesh this out. Let me flesh this out. You guys are there? Okay. Verse 30. This is he of whom I said, afterward comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Verse 33, you guys there? This is John's testimony. I myself did not know him. But for that purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. You guys are there? Let me keep reading. And John bore witness. He says, I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. And look at what he said again in verse 33. I myself did not what? Know him. You guys see that? Now back up to um, verse, what is it, Um, chapter, yeah, verse 28, verse 26. Back up to verse 26. If you're there, say amen. Look at what John said. John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not what? No. And here's the point. It's possible to have met Jesus but not recognize him. Y'all tracking with me. Lord, I don't know how far we're going to get, but Lord, give me strength. Remember with me. John was Jesus' first cousin. And don't fool yourself into thinking that they had not seen each other up until the text that we're reading. Remember with me, during Mary's pregnancy, six months later, she went and visited her cousin, Elizabeth, who was already with child. And so the babies in their womb leap. Y'all know the story. So I'm saying that to say this. There was a natural familial tie because they grew up in the hood together. Come on, y'all. Talk to me. Talk to me. Come on, y'all. Come. Now, 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 the reason I had the line here is because John stepped out six months before Jesus. In, in lay terms, we say he announced his call <laughs> six months before Jesus. But go back with me to childhood. And now we're on this side of the fence in the Old Testament. And Elizabeth would go over to Mary's house. Or vice versa, Mary would come to Elizabeth's house. And they would carry their children with them because there was no such thing as hiring babysitters. Y'all talk to me this morning. And I could see Mary and Elizabeth saying to John and Jesus, why don't y'all go outside and play? Y'all know this. And I could see John and Jesus in the backyard playing marbles. And John would say, Jesus, watch this shot. And he'd shoot and John would miss. 
And Jesus will say, John, you watch this shot. <laughs> and he's shooting, and Jesus could never miss, and John couldn't figure out why. Y'all not hearing me. <laughs> Go with me in your mind for a little while. Or just see those boys playing basketball, right? And they're playing a game of horse. And Jesus backs up. Just use your mind. Over the rim, around the backboard, on the corner, and he'd shoot a three-pointer. And they'd be like, dang, gee, you ought to join the NBA, man. You don't miss nothing. Y'all not getting this with me. But, but all they were, they were cousins at the time. They were children. They had met each other, but he did not know who he was. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. Remember with me, the only person in the family who knew Jesus, who Jesus was, was Mary, his mother, who the angel revealed to him. And you could understand when Jesus first started to come out and she took him to that wedding party. Hey, Jesus, they're out of wine. Shh, can't nobody know. That's what he said. And then all of a sudden they're grown. And listen, I'm thinking to myself, God reveals to John who Jesus is. And here's John. Oh, it makes sense. No wonder that joker wouldn't miss a shot. Oh, it makes sense. Man, no wonder he was running across the pool like it wasn't nobody's business. I thought he was just fast. <laughs> now it makes sense. And here's what he said. He, 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 he says that, so, so the reason I'm saying that to me is because some of you were in the car accident. And, and the only reason you made it out was because Jesus stepped in and you met him, but you didn't reckon, I wish I had somebody in here. The only reason you're here is because the marriage almost killed you and Jesus stepped in and you met him, but you didn't recognize him for who he is. The only reason you got a job today and food on the table and the only reason you woke up this morning clothed and in your right mind is because Jesus stepped in. You met him, but you haven't recognized him because you don't know who he is. I wish I had somebody. And listen, y'all, listen, y'all. I'm not talking about you because I was in the same boat. I met him, but I didn't recognize him. So here's what I used to say. Man, I sure was lucky. No, baby, you weren't lucky. Jesus stepped in. <laughs> and you met him, but you might not have recognized him. Are oh, you hear me? You met him. But you might not have recognized him because God had not yet revealed to you who he is. Remember with me, his 12 disciples, and we're not going to get far with this. We have to pick this up next week. Here's his 12 disciples, 12 people, and he's going around for three years doing ministry. Then he stops one time and he says, who are the people saying that I am? Am I still John's cousin, the good ball player? Am I still just a prophet? And here's what they say. Some say you're Elisha. Some saying you're John the Baptist. Some say you're a prophet. But here's Peter. I know, I know, I know you who you are. And he says, yeah, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Here's what Jesus says. Flesh and blood. Because a whole lot of folk have met me. But they haven't recognized me yet because God has not yet revealed. Come on, is this making sense? I, wa I want you to hear me say it because if you track John's ministry, and, and the problem with reading the Gospels and, and, and the Bible is that sometimes we don't know how to at attach timelines to our reading, and we read everything in isolation. If you were to read this rendition in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you would see Matthew and Mark and Luke, and they're all speaking about like this, then came John to Jesus to be baptized of him, right? And this same story in the references just comes across as if Jesus was being baptized by John. John kind of summarizes everything. Jesus came out, and I recognized who he was. Because, uh, understand with me, when John was doing his work, and and and, and he got in prison. Here's the message he sent out. Hey, is that Jesus or should I wait for another? And lock into Jesus' response, right? Man, you see what I'm doing? 
Remember those shots we used to shoot in the backyard? Come on, y'all. Remember that time Sally Mae got sick and y'all taught you took her to the doctor? I snuck up in her room. Get up. <laughs> Here's what he said to John. You saw the things I did. You saw the miracles. Y'all tracking with me? So, so, so I want us to meet Jesus today because a lot of the things we go through in life, we don't give him credit for who he is and what he's doing. He's God all by himself. Come on, let me press through this because I want, I, I want to make it as far as I can. So lock into this. So, so, so Jesus is God's lamb. Here, here's the reason he's able to do this. He's God's lamb. As God's lamb, he possessed the spirit of God. Come on, say he possessed the Spirit of God. Say it again. Say he possessed the Spirit of God. Now watch this, and then, then I think I'm going to pause. I have to say one thing, and then we'll stop. Now watch this. Go down to, what verse is that? Verse 33. Go to verse 33. And notice this. Well, let's read 32. I bore witness. I saw the Spirit from heaven like a dove descend from heaven like a dove. And it remained on him. Don't miss that. Okay? Verse 33, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Y'all might say, what's the big deal? In the Old Testament, here's what would happen. The Spirit would come. The Spirit would leave. In the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and the Spirit would leave. So, for example, on Samson, the Spirit came on him and he tore the temple down, killing people. On David, the Spirit came, he killed Goliath, and when he messed up with Bathsheba, the Spirit left. Y'all know this, come on. On and on and on, Elijah, all the prophets in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come and the Spirit would leave. Here's what John is saying about Jesus. It must be time for this to happen because I saw the Spirit come on and it didn't leave. <laughs> no. That's good stuff, right? Because here's what he said. I saw the Spirit come on him. And here's what John's saying. In all my observations of his life, there was never a time where he found himself powerless because the Spirit was always on him. So when he encountered the woman of Nain with the dead son, he could still heal. When he went by the pool of Bethsaida, he could still heal. When he fed the 5,000, he could still heal. He did all the miraculous because the Spirit came and it stayed and there was never a time in his life where he was powerless. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> if you're a child of God, the Spirit has come on you and it has not left. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all. Y'all didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. Because so, so there's no reason to be defeated because the Spirit has come upon you and the Spirit has not left. So listen to me. There's never an instance in your life, never, ever, 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 where you're ever powerless. Because the Spirit of God has come to rest on you. Let, let me help you. Acts 1 and 8. Acts 1 and 8. And you shall receive what? Power when what? The Holy Spirit does what? comes upon you. So, so stop living your life with an Old Testament framework. As if the Spirit has come and the Spirit is gone. Lord, I'm so tempted. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to get me a drink. You don't have to because you have the power to overcome. Y'all not hearing me. Lord, I'm just so tempted. Uh, uh, uh. Bubba, show sure look good right now. Bubba, what you doing? You better come over. You don't have to because the Spirit of God is on you. And I wish I had somebody in here. There never ought to be a moment in your life, in my life, where you feel powerless because the Spirit of God is on you. 
It's not a come and go thing. And John said, I knew who he was because I watched that booger. And there never was a time after his baptism where he was powerless. And John said to his disciples, see y'all? That's going to happen to y'all too. Because this is what he says. He's going to baptize you with his spirit. So that same spirit that he has, that same spirit fitting to come on all y'all. Church, that's good. I wish I had somebody in here. That's good news. So this is why he says this one. I'm done. I'm done. I wanna, I'm going to read one more thing and I'll be done. <laughs> this is just juicy stuff. And this, 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 this is rich. It is. It's helping me. It's helping me. It's helping me. Because here's what it says, and I'm not saying this is my problem, but here's what it says. I don't have to look at porn anymore. I only do it because I want to, not because I have to. The power is on me. I don't need that marijuana stick no more because I live in Colorado. I only do it because I want to, not because I have to. I have to. Do, I've got the power. Y'all, y'all not hear me. Yeah, I've got the power, y'all. It's in me. And greater is he that is in where me than he that is in the world. Same thing Jesus did. We can do it. So here's what Jesus says. The things you see me do, greater than these shall you. Yeah. Y'all just make me feel, come on, say, I've got the power. Oh, come on, say it like you mean it. Say, I've got the power. <laughs> you need to know who that is. So we don't have to give in. We can transcend, right? We can transcend. Here, here, here's the last thing. Let me say this last thing, then I'll stop. Because I want you to get this. To know Jesus is to acknowledge him as God incarnate. And what that means, because here's what, here's, what, here's, what, here's what the word says. Look at that last verse in verse 34. 34. And I have seen... And have bore witness that this is the Son of God. God manifested in flesh, living in me. Come on, worship team. In the form of his spirit. People, the church of God is an extremely powerful entity. And when I'm talking about the church, I'm not talking about the building. I'm not talking about Restoration Christian Fellowship. I'm talking about me and I'm talking about you. The called out people of God within which the presence of God dwells. That makes us something. But you must know who Jesus is. So this is why I'm saying to say, if, if you don't know Jesus, meet him. He's God's remedy for sin. So that tells me, and here's the encouraging word, because during the week I get tempted. During the week I get distracted. During the week I, I, I am prone to do things I have no business doing. Here, here's what the back end of my week looked like. And I've got to say the back end because the front end didn't look nothing like this. The moment I got revelation that Jesus was God's remedy for sin and that he lived in me, here's what I started saying to myself. Boy, you better not do that. You've got power over it. <laughs> Man, that changed my thought. That changed my natural inclinations. And that changed everything about me. Y'all not hearing me. Let me be transparent for a moment. All of a sudden, she didn't look as good as she looked before I found that out. <laughs> oh, don't act like it's only my problem, fellas. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Are you with me? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God's son made flesh come down to dwell among us but he must be in you. Don't be one who have met him, but haven't recognized him for who he is. <laughs> you want to know him this morning? If you have not met him, invite him into your life. And watch what God's going to do. I don't know about you, but I love God this morning. I love him, I love him, I love him. I love him, and the more I grow closer to him, the more he reveals himself to me. So bow your heads with me. As a matter of fact, just stand to your feet. Stand to your feet this morning. God, as your word has gone forth for this morning, it's rich. 
sharper than any two-edged sword, God, piercing going in and coming out. We love you, God. You're great, you're wonderful, you're merciful, you're kind. You're all that, God. So we thank you for what you do, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the richness of Scripture, God, what you're doing in our lives. So as we stand in your presence this morning, God, we want to take a moment just to love you. Thank you for being there even though we didn't. We met you, but we didn't recognize you. Forgive us for that. So this morning, we come worshipful. We begin by saying, God, forgive us, God. Cleanse us, make us whole again. Make us whole again, God. And we give our hearts. If there's one here that don't know you, draw them, God. Draw them, God. Draw them, God.